This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. happy to introduce our next speaker. Pat Garrity comes to us from Washington University in St. Louis. He's uh, been a leader in multiple trials uh, in endovascular and surgical treatment in the lower extremity. Pat's going to talk to us about how he treats TAS D lesions in the patients who don't have a vein. Pat. Thank you very much. And let me start by thanking the hosts here at UCSF for putting on this great uh, conference and letting me participate. Um, that was a really, really thoughtful debate, and I'm pleased because it kind of sets the stage for what I wish to talk about. Um, a little bit of a masochism to accept this task because really this is something that I truthfully approach with trepidation when I see these patients. Um, I think it's, I'll hope to show you that there, there are many open data questions that surround the appropriate choices for these people. Here are my disclosures. As Mike mentioned, I work as a trial PI on a couple different trials and uh, serve on some advisory boards. For TAS2 type lesions, so actually if you read the TAS2 document, they, they kind of lump two considerations under one heading here, which is somewhat confusing. And, and today we're really just going to be talking about the chronic total occlusions of the common femoral or SFA. And I'm going to further push that out and say I don't touch chronic total occlusions of the common femoral artery. Uh, this is one of those wordings in TAS2 where you wonder how it got there. Uh, so really, this is SFA greater than 20 centimeters that may or may not involve the proximal popliteal artery. Uh, we will not be talking about treatment of the chronic total occlusion of the popliteal and proximal trifurcation vessels. I have no data to suggest that that is a wise or desirable process. So if we have those TAS D lesions of the SFA and we do not have vein available for consideration for bypass, uh, I'll kind of start along hopefully the same thoughtful track as my predecessors here. How can we maximize patient benefit and minimize harm? So which of these patients face the highest risk? And I'll try to tease out some of the oddities about the trial data that we rely upon to, to bring that into high uh, relief here. Uh, do we have good data for treatment of uh, these very long lesions? Are there some caveats about that SFA trial data and design that we should consider? And do the perceived failure patterns affect our initial choices? Uh, do we let them end to into our practice choices up front rather than after the fact? So before we do any procedures, it's really important to emphasize that when you see a TAS-D lesion, if you see a TAS-K lesion, you're at a rare clinical moment. You're at a moment of leverage in promoting, promoting risk factor modification, particularly for the claudicates. This is the 10 minutes where you will save lives. Everything else you do in the cath lab and in the OR may save a limb. It's very unlikely to save a life. So the statins and not the stents are what gives a survival benefit to these patients. And the tobacco cessation is critical to success. And honestly, I, there's very few things that I feel happier about when I successfully scare the crap out of a patient and six months later they're not smoking anymore because then I have really done something for them. Um, and I really do try to plug in the claudicants in a trial of structured walking and uh, treatment with cytostasol. For structured walking, I live in the <clears throat> Midwest where we have a pretty, can vary from modest to severe winter, so we give them the usual instructions of going to one of the big box stores or a mall, taking at least 30 minutes, begin walking until you experience discomfort, stop and stand or sit if necessary until it goes away and then restart. So nobody pays for this, we can't get paid therapists to conduct this, but you can put people through a pretty good trial plug them in for a scheduled file visit in three months, and if they're improving, you can really get a substantial share of these people diverted into appropriate medical management with claudication. However, the urgent nature of CLI means that we usually don't have that luxury of pursuing those options, and so some of those risk factor modifications can't be accomplished. But overall, as, as both Mike and Peter emphasized, we probably do a really poor job of, of informing our patients about the expectations for these lesions. And if you're blunt with them, particularly if they're having fairly modest symptoms or otherwise limited by comorbidities, I think most wise patients with claudication will consider turning away if you really spell out the data for them for TAS-D lesions. 
So when we look at data collection and lesion length, I think most of the room here is aware that the FDA approval studies focus primarily on stenoses and lesions 10 centimeters or less in length. The TASTI lesions are overwhelmingly more likely to be chronic total occlusions and require multiple stents for treatment. The treatment of occlusions predicts higher failure both in the primary treatment and in treatment of restenosis. Overlap zones create rigidity, create stress risers. These lead to fractures, the higher risk of instant restenosis. So it's not clear at all that we can extrapolate the approval length patency data out to these TASTI lesions. It's just not a simple shifting of the, of the line. This is a somewhat tired slide that I still like to use because I keep adding little dots to it each year. And I think it, it helps us tell a little bit of a story as to uh, the, how the industry is coming along. So in the green box are the approval studies on the far left. Short lesions, we're trying to get products on the market. We just want to prove that they're modestly safe and efficacious for treatment of these primarily stenotic lesions of the SFA. And there have been favorable patency trends, and Chris did a very nice job of detailing how the industry continues to work at this. And really in the background, if I look at the old Vibrant study that we ran and, and come forward to the modern day, it's very clear both in covered stents and in bare metal stents that the patencies, patencies have really stepped up over time. Why exactly that's true, we haven't so much put a fine point on, but certainly I think increased flexibility of stents, better radial support in some cases, better manufacturing techniques in terms of electropolishing and better handling of the night and all components. Uh, certainly the luminal surface modifications may play a role. And lastly, the introduction of drug has certainly seemed to play a, a little, gave us another little step up as well. Unfortunately though, sometimes familiarity breeds contempt. And so because the SFA approval trials all deal with the same lesion lengths, we now have a, a bit of a issue with lateral pseudo comparisons of data where uh, we have these apples and oranges comparisons of, yes, you have a drug eluting stent or a covered stent, but my lesion length was kind of like yours, and I'm going to put something in a magazine that kind of implies that mine is somehow equal or better than, than yours. These really aren't statistically valid comparisons, despite the similarity of lesion length. They're not propensity matched. Believe me, you can do an actual head-to-head -head comparison. I would welcome it, but you're never going to see it because they're expensive and nobody wants to lose that comparison. And in general, if you look at that, in the recent year, people have done this trying to seek uh, favorable comparisons to the drug eluting stent. Currently, that's just the Zilber PTX. I'm sure we'll have more joining it down the road. So why do I like drugs? Here is not the, not the graph that you're probably expecting. So, but this is what really, as I started staring at the outcomes data for the Vibrant trial, what really piqued my interest was this. Over the first year, and granted this was old technology, these were the old stiff night null stents, the unimproved first generation Viabon, but we saw this tremendous drop off over year one. But if you could make it beyond year one, that line really started to flatten out. And so this is that excellent target for biologic modification of the process. Because in almost every trial, when you look at the long-term result, you do see some attrition over coming years out to four years and beyond but it's a fairly gentle process. So if you can modify that critical first year, I think we're setting ourselves up for some better longer term results. There it is, that tired slide. So I think everyone's familiar with the internal randomization that occurred for the Zilber PTX trial. They started as a simple balloon trial and went out when you got failed, you got for provisional stenting, you got internally randomized to the exact same platform bare stent or bare stent with drug. And I like it, not so much for this because everything beats angioplasty, but for this, because it's an expensive bet and they want it. So it's good science and it shows that there is some drug effect that extends starting probably at that critical early period. And then once you've made the difference out here, it sustains. So I think it, it gives us hope that with continued, maybe even improved biologic modifiers that we can see those good primary patency re results that will lift a lot of the issues of restenosis off our back. Trial data is a, um, it's a bit of a squirrel when you look at it. And I'm, I'm partially to blame for this, so mea culpa. Um, if we look at what you don't normally pick up when you look at these studies, it's really quite important, and particularly when you come to thinking about TASTI lesions. So in virtually every study that we've mentioned today, the enrollment in the trial occurred after wire crossing was accomplished, meaning the highest risk for technical failure was taken completely out of the picture and never talked about again. 
And even when we talked about intent to treat in one of those studies, I guarantee you that was post-wire crossing intent to treat analysis. So what we don't have when we're having that conversation in the clinic with a patient is really a true grasp on intent to treat results, and this is true for critical limb ischemia as well. Another thing is the proximal stump criterion. So when we wrote some of these old protocols for SFA trials, we didn't want people boogering up the profunda, so within the trial protocol is a little caveat that says you can't enroll if the first centimeter of the SFA isn't a beautiful, clean little stump that you can safely end your intervention in. Very different from the flush SFA origin occlusions that we commonly associate with TASTI lesions. And so in these trials, there was really no risk to profunda flow, and that's very different from what you may see in your routine practice as you address these. The last is the use of different PSVR criteria uh, for stenosis. I didn't put all the slides in because I wanted to keep to my 10 minutes, but we, we spelled that out in the Vibrant trial if you go look at it, and it ramps up as you go from 2.0 to 2.5 to 3.0. It goes up 5% or a little bit more in terms of your, of your patency estimates. So what that particular manufacturer chose does have a slight effect in terms of those lateral comparisons. Do we have TAS data? Um, yes, we have some. So uh, there's a Durability 200 study done by Boziers in Europe looking at bare metal stents. Uh, we have two experiences with the Viabon, the Viper single arm trial, and the Viastar randomized trial from U.S. and uh, Europe, respectively. And we have from Boziers again uh, in the Zilver single arm experience, they broke out the long lesions and looked at that. So here we are back to my favorite slide, but instead of looking at those approval ones, I'm going to draw your attention out to the far right-hand side. These are all one-year primary patencies. What we don't have is a good long-term handle on how these uh, behave. But what we're seeing is that with these modifications of the Viabon graft and with some of the drug and even with some of the good plain bare metal stents, that at least at one year we're seeing a, an acceptable initial primary patency rate that's going to continue to fall off over time. We really don't have a clear picture as to whether or not it's going to fall off more rapidly than we would expect when dealing with these short lesions. And it's very important as we make these final treatment decisions to think about our failure analysis or the, the failure patterns that we uh, are going to expect. Um, is it benign or malignant? The, the data may really vary between experiences. Uh, I've had a lot of conversations with Mike here. When we ran the Vibrant trial, we saw very low rates of progression to acute limb ischemia. I still can't statistically prove that that was due to the surveillance regimen mandated by the trial, but I suspect that's likely the case. Uh, his group here at UCSF has reported a significantly higher risk of limb threat when they followed up aggressive covered stenting patients. Certainly, I think the stent location is a player. If you're looking at having to cover geniculate collaterals, that's a problem. Uh, the vibrant, if you look at the Viper data, the, the data for small caliber graphs is actually acceptable, but God love me, I still can't trust it. I can't put a five millimeter Viabon in somebody. I just don't think it's going to be a good performer over time. So when I look finally at the TASTI treatment and try to make myself commit to giving you recommendations here, all three device genres have acceptable data in small experiences of 100 to 150 patients out to one year. Multi-year follow-up is lacking. I think the careful examination of the secondary interventions and failure patterns is just simply not there in this picture. So for me, personally, I, I lean towards drug-eluting stents currently. I think it modifies that crucial early part of the curve. Uh, certainly in certain anatomic considerations, if there's a risk of geniculate collateral coverage, I'm absolutely favoring drug-eluting stents or bare metal stents. I will traverse to the mid palpatial only in critical limb ischemia patients uh, who have no, uh, who have poor uh, prospects for surgical bypass, no vein, uh, and I certainly would favor drug-eluting stents there as well. For patients with poor tibia runoff, it was not a player in our trial, but I think overall for covered stents, the more sluggish you make the flow, the higher your risk of catastrophic thrombosis. And lastly, if there's a truly flush occlusion at that, of the SFA, it can be done technically, but we have zero data in that in the literature. And so if it's a claudication patient, I favor non-operative manage management of those if I'm not going to pursue surgical bypass. If you had to address this in critical limb ischemia, I would favor doing it cautiously and using a drug eluding stent. I think that's all for me. Thank you very much. Thank you.